Davis. Um, where we're talking about penetrance. And penetrance is that weird phenomenon where you might have the genotype, but you don't have the phenotype. And so there's something went wrong in the, the process of actually expressing that genotype. Now there's another thing that, um, that comes up when we talk about uh, decreased penetrance. And that is something that's called uh, decreased or, or variable expressivity. Now, for variable expressivity, that's when you have the same genotype as someone else, but your specific phenotype may look slightly different. And that's something that there's something else modifying the genotype within the individual. Now, penetrance is whether you have it or not. It's yes or no. But with variable expressivity, it's kind of a degree to which you have it. So you definitely have it. It's not like a decreased penetrance thing. So you definitely have the trait. You just may have different, a different bar variation of that trait. But remember, this is the same genotype, same two alleles. But we have different manifestation of those two alleles. So we can use polydactyly again as our example, because if you actually express that trait, you may express it mildly in uh, like with the young man with the baseball with the extra finger. Here we see two feet and we just see an extra uh, um, digit at the end. So they just have one extra toe. So you can see the abnormality is in this last, I think that's the, that's the metatarsal or the tarsal, I don't remember. So in this bone here, it's kind of split at the end, and so you wind up with two toes. But someone who has the same exact genotype may have a severe case. And so this is a severe case of polydactyly, where you see that kind of the whole foot is replicated. So it's not just one extra toe, it's multiple. So you have a big toe, then you have one, two, three, four, normally. And then this individual has three extra toes on each foot. And so rather than just having the doubling of one of those, probably has doubling of two of those to wind up with some extra toes. Right. Now, what causes variable expressivity is part of the sort of um, curiosity uh, that comes with genetics. Because we don't really know what causes that. Um, it could be another gene. Maybe um, there's another gene that also has to do with foot development that may add to it. So maybe they're uh, recessive for both. It may be there's an environmental factor that um, maybe if you have the genotype plus some other environmental thing, then you'll have uh, like a double phenotype. Um, what I can think of, the best example I can think of there is a condition called spina bifida. Has anybody ever heard of that? So that's a condition that's both genetic and environmental. And um, if you inherit the genetic susceptibility for it, you may or may not have it, which would be penetrance. But then you also may have a differing degree of severity of that. And so spina bifida is where the spinal column doesn't close. And so you have, because you have an open spine, that means you're uh, susceptible to a lot of neurological problems. So you have problems with the pressure in your spinal column. The, um, the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't flow properly because it's kind of like it goes down and then it kind of goes out and then it comes back in. So you have problems with a lot of um, neurological issues. Uh, why I brought that up is because that's really um, associated with the, um, the supplementation of folic acid during pregnancy. And so because we know that now, that the severity is associated with a lack of folate, then we can actually put that in the prenatal vitamins. And so a lot of prenatal vitamins have a large amount of folate, which is a B vitamin. And we actually also supplement flour. So all flour is supplemented with folate and niacin. You'll see that there's a, a bunch of B complex stuff that's added to just regular uh, wheat flour. 
Now the issue there is that we're starting to use so many other types of flour that some, some pregnant women don't actually get wheat flour. So that's why the prenatal vitamins are really important um, for the supplementation of that folate. Now one of the conditions that I actually studied was a condition called treacher collins syndrome that shows both, uh, that shows like a, a, a tremendous amount of variable expressivity in that you can have generations that look nothing like each other in terms of phenotype. But all three of these individuals have the same genotype, but they are differently affected. Now they're differently affected, but we don't know why they're differently affected. We just know that they are. So this would be granddad that originally had the, uh, the allele that causes the treacher Collins syndrome. We have mom, so this, this is his daughter, who is a little bit more affected in that you can kind of see that the sides of her face are really narrow, and you can kind of see that he has a narrow face as well. Well, he just has deafness. She has deafness and a little bit of um, uh, unusual facial development. And then you get to the granddaughter who had such severe facial development problems that she's been, at this point in her life, she had been through 80 different surgeries to correct bony problems in her facial bones. And so um, you can go anywhere from so mild he didn't even know he had it to so severe that it's like, like threatening with the same exact genotype. So variable expressivity just has to do with the range of, of severity that you can have having the same genotype and the, and the phenotype that's expressed. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about what can cause decreased penetrance and what can cause variable expressivity and all of those kinds of things. So um, one of the biggest uh, um, interactions we get to create different phenotypes, unexpected phenotypes, is an environmental effect. And that's important because when you think about living in the wild, I mean, humans have evolved past living in the wild culturally. We live in houses where we control our climate. We have artificial light at night. We have artificial air conditioning and heating in the winter, etc. But if we were living outside, like all the other animals do, we would notice these um, traits that we have that are more associated with the seasons. As the seasons change throughout the year, your phenotypes change with the seasons. A lot of these phenotypes have to do with uh, that particular species adaptation to the environment. And so species that tend to change in different seasons tend to have these environmental interactions. Um, a, a, the example from your book would be a temperature sensitive allele that changes depending on the outside temperature. So here we have an Arctic fox and in winter time, the Arctic fox is white. Why is an Arctic fox white in the winter? to blend in so it can sneak up on its prey, right? Now, in the summertime, that nice, thick, white coat wouldn't fit the environment. The environment changes in the seasons. And so in the summertime, as the snow melts and the temperature gets warmer, it doesn't need a thick coat for warmth. It doesn't need uh, white fur for camouflage because if it had white fur in the summertime, it would stick out, right? And it wouldn't be able to sneak up on its prey. So we have these temperature sensitive alleles that are going to allow those changes to happen from season to season. And if you have a dog or a cat, you absolutely have seen these when your dog or cat sheds from season to season. You may have a cat that sheds like their entire coat. I had a pet rabbit that would just start like it would molt and huge clumps of fur when it came to the summertime. It's really weird looking. But this allele is off when it's cold 
And then the pigment allele gets turned on when it's warm. That's what causes the brown fur. We also have the loss of the extra uh, undercoat. So the undercoat gets shed so that it doesn't overheat in the summertime. Okay. Now the same gene that encodes pigment for fur in animals and mammals is used in an opposite way in other types of mammals. So here we have, we have a predator and we have prey. <laughs> and here we have another type of predator. But these two share the way that their temperature allele, temperature sensitive allele works in that in winter time, the uh, pigment gene actually turns on. So it's cold sensitive. And so when it turns on, it, it actually only pigments the areas of the body that are cold, right? So when you go out in a cold, on a cold day, the first parts of your body that turn cold are your nose and your ears and your extremities, your fingertips and all that. And the reason that it does that, what would happen if you went out on a hot day in a dark colored shirt versus a light colored shirt? You'd get hot really fast. So what this does is it provides a type of solar warming to these animals when they're out in the cold and they have these extremities that would be subject to frostbite if they got too cold. And so this is a way of protecting their extremities and keeping them warm in the warm, you know, in the winter sunshine. Same thing with cats. You have that um, pigmentation in the winter time, but not in the summertime. So uh, this is an interesting experiment. I used to have a Siamese cat, and one, uh, one winter he got wounded and we had to shave his side to take care of the wound. And he goes out in the winter and he develops a big brown patch of fur. So the new fur that came in was brown because the, the hair that was growing needed to protect that area. But then in the summertime, when he shed that coat, it went back to the normal, uh, like, white color that he was originally. Because he just grew new hair out over it. So we have uh, alleles that respond to cues in the environment to help those uh, organisms survive their environment. So that's one way that you would have variable expressivity. Can you imagine how this would be variable? Think about where rabbits normally live. Like a rabbit at the equator wouldn't necessarily develop such a dark coat because it wouldn't need to. Because at the equator, you don't really have winter. But then if it lived in a polar region, it would be colder year round and you would it would be more like this year round. So it can vary uh, based on environmental cues. That's one thing that, if you think about it, um, all temperature sensitive alleles are really dependent on the where you live, right? Your latitude. Now, other types of environmental actions can be dietary. So, if you don't have what the enzyme works on, then um, then you don't have to worry about it. This is a condition called phenylketonuria. I know I introduced it before. But what happens is you're missing an enzyme that breaks down the um, compound phenylalanine. Does anybody know what phenylalanine is? What kind of molecule that is? Yeah, it's an amino acid. So that means that it's gonna be in protein, right? So if you don't have the enzyme to break down one amino acid that's gonna be in a bunch of protein, then you really, if you start eating proteins, then you're gonna accumulate all this phenylalanine in your body because you can't break it down. And what happens is the phenylene builds up and it actually builds up in the brain mostly and it causes learning deficiencies and it causes low intelligence and it causes a lot of issues with um, a, a brain function because the brain just can't work with all that extra material in it. So this is actually the most preventable form of uh, mental deficiency because it's di it has a dietary component to it. Now, um, for 
uh, patients who have this, and it's relatively common in some populations. Um, I'm trying to think of, of uh, I, I feel like it's like a um, an Eastern uh, Asian population, so sort of the Middle East area. Um, it's quite common in those populations. And so they've developed a supplement food, because they can't drink breast milk, they can't drink cow's milk, they can't drink other kinds of milk. So there's a supplement that's just for patients with this condition, this enzyme deficiency, that has low phenylalanine foods in it, or low phenylalanine molecules in it. And by preventing that buildup of, peak of uh, phenylalanine, you can prevent the problems that come later on. The problem is that phenylalanine is also used to make um, serotonin, it's made used to make dopamine, it's used to make uh, melatonin and melanin, so a bunch of other compounds. Um, and because of that, patients who have this tend to have very, um, very pale skin, very light hair, very light eyes, because they can't make enough melanin to actually melanize their skin. And so um, it's common to see them with very, very, very pale uh, skin. And this picture of the two mice over here, um, these would be PKU mice. So these are mice where they've actually knocked out that enzyme gene. And the mouse is um, uh, fed the right food, the phenylalanine negative food, and then this mouse is not. And so you can see the difference between the two that um, one is able to develop normally and the other still has some of the symptoms of that condition. Now, what else was going to say about that? Oh well, I'll think of it later. I was going to say one more thing. Now we mentioned temperature sensitive alleles in terms of pigmentation, but there are also some temperature sensitive alleles that lead to body structures like development, um, particularly in flies, uh, and this is just regular flies, not fruit flies or anything. In regular flies, they have a temperature sensitive allele that leads to the number of lenses that are part of their eyes. You know, flies have compound eyes, which means that each one of these little facets right here is an independent lens. And so the way that it sees is that it has all of these different, basically like having a bunch of eyes around your head, and then the brain coordinates all the information together to give it kind of a single image. And so that way this, the fly can basically see around it. That's why they're so fast when you go to catch one because they can see you coming. They have excellent vision. But the weird thing is that depending on the temperature that they're raised in, the number of those little lenses changes. And so we can actually see this as a continuous trait, meaning that it kind of has a linear relationship. So the colder the temperature, the colder the temperature, the more little lenses they have. The warmer the temperature, the fewer of those little lenses they have. So we have this kind of inverse relationship between temperature and number of lenses. Now, why, <laughs> so why don't we have anything below 15? Anybody ever had to like raise flies? Obviously not intentionally. Um, it's too cold, they don't develop below 50 and it's too warm above 30, so they won't develop on either one. The coolest thing about flies is that when they are in the air conditioning, they slow down, and that's why they need more visual cues, because their body system slows down, and they have to be able to see things better as they're coming to get them. But it's just uh, this something we call a norm of reaction, to kind of see the, the degree to which they respond to their environment. So if you're trying to kind of understand this idea that the phenotype can change depending on some kind of environmental condition, right? So we, we see this variable expressivity of the phenotype. 
and you wanted to do an experiment. Um, you had this hypothesis that polydactyly is related to the, the volume of fluid in the maternal environment. So definite environment phenotype interaction. So suppose it was discovered that the severity of phenotype in polydactyly, that is the number of extra fingers and or toes in an individual was associated with fluid volume of the maternal environment. So how much fluid is in the, the, uh, the womb um, as the baby is developing? Could you discover the normal reaction for this condition and how would you attempt this? What if this was your hypothesis? How would you set up your experiment? What are your two variables? What's your dependent variable? What's your measuring? Number of fingers. Number of, yeah. number of fingers, severity of phenotype. And so your independent variable would be? Fluid volume. Maternal volume, like fluid volume. And so um, how would you measure that? Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't remove the fluid, right? You'd probably do some kind of density study where you kind of figure out how much fluid is there based on density. And you could kind of try to graph it by the volume versus the number of fingers. Does that make sense? And so you would find either a positive relationship, the higher the volume, the more the fingers, or the lower the volume, the more fingers would be a, a negative relationship. All right, Hot, I'm making you think on a Friday afternoon. All right, so let's get into some ways that we can think of dominant inheritance. So remember, we're talking about changes, like variable expressivity, some incomplete penetrance, and so thinking about how those can actually come about. So one way we can think about this, remember we're thinking about the heterozygote in this chapter, because a homozygote is gonna be whatever the homozygote is for dominant, whatever the homozygote is for recessive, because if the same alleles are gonna produce the same products. But if you have a heterozygote, meaning you have two different alleles, uh, we can see some effects of that. Now you can have environmental effects with your homozygote, that's true. But in this case, we're looking at our heterozygote. And if you remember from that initial slide, we looked at the, the red parent, the white parent, and the pink offspring, do you remember that picture? When you have an offspring, a, a heterozygote, that is somewhere between the two parents, we just call that incomplete. So it's kind of the trait, but it's not totally the trait, so it's not quite complete, so it's incomplete dominance, kind of halfway there. So our heterozygote gives us an intermediate uh, phenotype. Now another type of dominance that we'll talk about, and we'll, we'll go through examples of each of these. Another type would be over dominance, and that's where uh, there's an advantage to the heterozygote. So the heterozygote performs better than either of the homozygotes. Normally we think about this when we think about selection, so selecting the heterozygote, and we'll, we'll look at an example of selection, but then we'll also look at some examples where the heterozygote just has a better function overall. We'll look at some examples of uh, where the heterozygote has a phenotype that comes from each of its alleles. And that's called codominance because we have two dominant alleles in one genotype. So they both show up. And then we will look at an example of hierarchical dominance where any one of your heterozygotes could have any combination of lots of alleles for the same gene. And so all of these can contribute to that variable expressivity, they can all contribute to that incomplete penetrance, but we're just kind of looking at what your heterozygote looks like. 
incomplete dominance. What we established is that basically the, the offspring, the heterozygous offspring, is halfway between both parents. And we saw that example in the first slide where we had a red parent, we had a white parent, and the red parent in this case is RR, and the white parent, uh, we now have a different type of gene symbol, and that reflects that we're no longer doing just dominant and recessive. So we're not big R, little r anymore. The gene is actually C, and the allele is R. And here the gene is C, but the allele is W for white. And so that doesn't tell us that this is recessive, because it's not recessive. We don't have that relationship anymore, okay? So just the gene symbol tells you that something's up. So this red individual only has two of these CR uh, um, alleles, so the gametes all have CR alleles. This white parent only has uh, CW alleles, and so it can only give you CW gametes. So when you combine those two together, you get one CR and one CW, that gives us pink. Because in this phenotype, white is not recessive to red. You get that? It's not recessive because it's not gone. So red is not dominant because it's not complete. Right, they're, both dominant. they're not both dominant. Now we don't use the word dominant anymore. We use the idea of incomplete dominance. So red is incompletely dominant over white. Okay, is that making sense? So we can't just use dominant recessive anymore. We have to use the actual terms that red is just incompletely dominant over white. Okay. Now, if white was yellow, red could be incompletely dominant over yellow, but we don't know until we do that experiment. Okay. And actually, in these four o'clock flowers, um, there are all kinds of incomplete dominant uh, alleles in that I grew those for the first time this year in my garden, and they, they did really well. So when you go to the next generation, so the first generation is all hybrids, they're all incomplete dominant. When you go to the next generation, you go through your cell fertilization, you get your uh, CR allele or your CW allele from each of the parents. So you have CR or CW, CR or CW. When you bring R and R back together, you go back to red. When you bring uh, R and W together, you go back to pink. R and W, pink, and W and W, white. Now what this does is it gives us the same genotypic ratio as if this was Mendelian, right? So we have one homozygous, two heterozygotes, and one homozygote. So that's the same ratio for the genotypes. But here, our phenotypic ratio matches our genotypic ratio. So our phenotypic ratio is one red to two pink to one white. And that's how you know it's an incomplete dominant if your genotypic and phenotypic ratios are the same. Right? Because a heterozygote has its own phenotype. Does that make sense? So all we're doing is we're interpreting the Punnett square slightly differently because we know that this gene operates under incomplete dominance rather than dominance uh, and recessive. Now molecularly what's going on, and I'm going to ask you about the molecular reason <laughs> on your test. Molecularly what's going on is that in your homozygous red, you have all the alleles making the red pigment. In the homozygous white, you have none of the alleles making pigment. And in heterozygous, heterozygous, you only have half of the alleles making the pigment, and that's not enough to overcome the white color of the tissue, right? 
And that's different than in Mendel's purple versus white, purple was enough, right? So even though it was heterozygous, it still showed the same color purple. Okay? That's the difference, the main difference. This is the one that most students struggle with, but it's the one that a lot of students get the other one incorrect with. Now, if we think about Mendel's um, actual experiments and the traits that he used, uh, one of the traits he used was uh, round versus wrinkled. And if you start to look at this trait from a different angle, not from the outside, but from the inside, you can actually see incomplete dominance as well. So it really depends on what part of the trait you're looking at, what phenotype you're interested in, that will tell you whether you're dealing with dominant or you're dealing with incomplete dominant. So here, we have the same genetic ratios. We have the homozygous, heterozygous, and homozygous. The heterozygous operates at a 50% level. With a dominant, 50% is enough to achieve the same phenotype. And with Mendel's peas, by looking at the outside, they look the same. But if you slice one of those peas open and look at it under a microscope, you'll see that they are in fact different. What you'll see is that this one has tons of starchy grains inside for storage. A heterozygote only has about half as much so that's a different phenotype than that one. They're not the same. And then the recessive has almost no starchy grains. And so you can see we actually get three different phenotypes. And so at this level, it's incomplete. At this level, it's complete. Y'all see that subtle difference? It has to do with how you actually look at the phenotype. Right? So you may see your inheritance pattern change depending on what you're looking at. So the first thing in the genetic study is to define your phenotype. Right. <clears throat> now, with overdominance, I mentioned that overdominance just means that the heterozygote has a better function than either of the homozygotes. And so in this case, we have um, a, an example of disease resistance. And so with disease resistance, you have this idea that the heterozygote provides you protection from a disease, but it also provides you protection from the recessive condition. So you get both benefits from the same genotype and the same phenotype. And so for here, if we have our normal homozygote, it's gonna get infected but if you have a heterozygote, there's something about that other allele that prevents the infection. But if you had two of those other alleles, the cell wouldn't perform correctly. Okay. We'll look at an example of sickle cell anemia in a second um, that's directly related to that. Now another thing that you guys may not be as familiar with is that some of your proteins actually work together. And so if you have two alleles in the same cell that are different, you actually have different ways that those two allele proteins can recombine. So if you have a, a say, uh, allele one and allele two, and they're both being expressed in a cell, you can have allele one and one together, you can have allele two and two together, or you can have allele one and two together. So in the same cell, you can have three different proteins. Whereas if you were homozygous, you would only have either one one, or you would have two two. So having, being a heterozygote gives you a wider array of proteins that you can work with. So that's what we're looking at here. If you just have one type of allele, you only make one type of protein. But if you have both types of alleles, you make three types of proteins. Yep. And that can definitely give us some variable expressivity, depending on how much of each one you have. Now another one has to do with varying your functional activity of the cell 
And say you have an enzyme, uh, one allele encodes the enzyme that works at one temperature, and the other allele encodes an enzyme that works at a different temperature. Well, if you're homozygote, you only have the one temperature range, either one or two. But if you're heterozygous, you have both temperature ranges. And so you're able to kind of work outside what would be considered normal, you can kind of work at those other temperatures. And that's really important for organisms that maybe live in an environment where the temperature changes. Think about global warming. As we warm up, the organisms that are able to work in more than one temperature range are the organisms that are going to do better, right? They're going to keep doing better and keep doing better and passing down their genes. So we'll start to see more and more heterozygotes for those traits. All right. So our example here of overdominance, uh, specifically with with the condition that you're probably uh, familiar with, is um, uh, sickle cell uh, uh, sickle cell anemia, sickle cell trait, and then normal hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein that's essential for carrying oxygen uh, in the red blood cells. Uh, it is a um, complex of four different proteins. So if you're homozygous HPA, then all the hemoglobin that you make is A and B hemoglobin. Because you, it's, two, it's two subunits of A and two subunits of B. If you're HBA, HBS, which means you carry the sickle cell trait, you can make HBA, HBB hemoglobin, or HBS, HBB hemoglobin. So you have two types. And because it's four subunits, you can have either two subunits of S or one subunit of S. So you've got all these different kinds of combinations that you can make. Now, if you're HBS, HBS, then that means that you can only make HBS, HBB hemoglobin, which means you only have one type. Now, surprisingly, it's not in oxygen delivery that's the problem. Because persons who have um, this type of hemoglobin, they can transport oxygen just fine. The problem comes when they are in oxygen deficient situations such as when you run up the stairs because you're late to class and you're out of breath. That's an oxygen deprivation condition. And that can actually set these hemoglobins to start losing their oxygen. And once you lose oxygen, what happens is the hemoglobins start to flatten out and they start to make a sticky, fibrous structure. They start to stick together. And that's what causes the sickle cell shape. So they, they create a misshapen shell, a, a cell, because of those long fibers, because of the oxygen loss. And so that's what causes the, the symptoms of sickle cell uh, disease, or sickle cell anemia, meaning that your red blood cells start to die off, right? Because anemia means you don't have enough red blood cell capacity. Now, enter into this, a bloodborne disease called malaria. And malaria is pretty, um, pretty serious. It's a pretty bad disease. Has anybody known someone who's gotten malaria? Uh, yeah, it's bad. I mean, it's like months of your life are just gone. It's, it's, you have these, and, and the treatment for it is as bad as the disease. I mean, the treatment is really bad. So, you don't want to get malaria. Is that rain? Oh my gosh. Thanks. All right. So, you don't want to get malaria. The great thing is that these heterozygotes, there's something about that HBA, HBS, HBB hemoglobin that changes the way that malaria enters the red blood cell. And so it can actually resist malarial infection because the, the parasite actually lives inside the red blood cells. And so if they can't live inside the red blood cells, then you don't get sick. So they're just kind of in your blood and your immune system attacks them. The reason that uh, they stay where they are and why you get sick is because normally they evade um, detection by hiding in 
your red blood cells. And so if they can't get in, you can't get sick, you are protected against malaria. So the question is, if you're protected against malaria and you don't really get sick because you do have some good oxygen capacity, what is that going to do to population levels of this HBS allele? What well, actually increases the, the frequency of this allele in, in populations where malaria is um, big, such as uh, swampy areas where there's lots of mosquitoes and hot areas where there's lots of, um, well, where there's just lots of malaria, jungles, things like that, where you see a lot of malaria and a lot of that uh, bloodborne disease. So that is why we still see a lot of sickle cell trait and sickle cell anemia in uh, populations that come from those regions. Do you have a question, Rainy? Like a kennel breed, not a kennel breed. What I want to say, an AKC breed, 
uh, pedigree, that's what I meant. Now, when you talk about all the phenotypes in a breed, that's something that has a special name called heterosis. And you don't need to remember that, that's just what it's called. And that's where you're trying to breed a healthy dog um, by mixing parents, uh, trying to get that heterozygote advantage as often as you can. All right. It's weekend time. Is this everybody's last class? No. 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 That stinks. I'm sorry. One more. One more. That's not too bad. <laughs>